Good afternoon. It is Wednesday, March 21st already, 5.02 p.m., and we're here to talk about grantor, I mean, qualified personal residence trusts. These are excellent, excellent vehicles for clients who want to make use of their $5,120,000 exemption. And my partners, Ken Crotty and Christy Nicola, are going to go over this with you in depth. First, I just want to mention some of our upcoming webinars that you have here in front of you. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be with Judge George Greer talking about mediation strategies. He'll be accompanied by Hamden Baskin. Stacy Eastland and I will do a webinar next week, Tuesday, March 27th, on GRATS and Remainder Purchase Marital Trusts. On April 2nd, my ex-partner London Bates and I will talk about should I stay or should I go, considerations in setting up your own law practice or staying where you are. Then we'll be talking about charging order protection Tuesday, April 3rd at 5 p.m., hiring and terminating employees April 4th at 2 p.m. for Bloomberg B&A, and probate and trust law considerations with Judge Jack St. Arnold August 26th. So keep us in mind. At our website, we have the following, or the complimentary webinars that you see here. And now I'm going to turn this over to my partners, Ken Crotty and Christy Nicola, to give you a general overview about qualified personal residence trusts, some great information on how to explain them to clients, and some really important things that you need to make sure you're aware of if you're going to be using qualified personal residence trusts or working with them. Chris and Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Alan. Uh, and, and as Alan said, Ken and I are going to start with general overview here of qualified personal residence trusts. And the basic question is, well, what exactly are they? And a qualified personal residence trust is an irrevocable trust that allows a client to transfer his or her residence to descendants or other desired beneficiaries at a reduced gift tax cost and pay no estate tax if the, the client outlives what's called the retained term that we'll describe a little bit later. The client can also live in the residence for as long as the client wishes. Of course, there are a little bit of, of rules and, and things we need to be aware of with respect to that, and we'll address that later. Uh, the basic mechanics of a qualified personal residence trust, the client transfers the residence to the trust, can serve as the trustee, and, and can reside in the trust for, for at least the number of years during what's called the retained term. Uh, the client can reside in the residence free of paying rent or free of any any type of cost for living in the house during that time. Uh, and, and during that period, it's called the retained term, the clients live there as if he owned it outright individually. Uh, the transfer of the, trust, of, of the house to the trust is a taxable gift. However, because of the language of Internal Revenue Code 2702, what the client receives back is valued, and that value is deducted from the value of the house transferred to the trust. Therefore, it allows us to transfer, essentially, a remainder interest in the house to the trust to benefit the children and other descendants. Uh, and, and, the, and the reason for that is under this 2702 code section, we, we, the, the right to live in the residence is what's called a qualified interest. Now, if the grantor just transferred any asset to the trust and used that asset, the gift tax value would still be the entire value of the asset. And that's because what, what the grantor receives back has to be what's called a qualified interest. And living in the house for a set term of years is, called, is, is considered a qualified interest under those regulations. One interesting thing to point out here is that if the client survives this retained term, the value of the house is not included in his or her gross estate for federal estate tax purposes. However, if the client dies during the retained term, the value of, of the house is included in the client's gross estate for estate tax purposes, uh, but the client would be no worse as if they had done no planning at all. Um, so it's something to consider, especially in light of these low interest rates that we see now and depressed home values due to market conditions. Uh, using QPERTs to transfer wealth is certainly a, a, a great idea in this day and age. And of course, we'll get into detail with respect to that uh, going forward here. Now on the next slide, Sorry about that. On the next slide, we get into more basics on QBIRTS, and this essentially reiterates what I had, had just gotten into. I do want to point out that the value of the gift made to the trust is determined by using the Section 7520 rate that is in effect 
as of the date of funding of the trust. And in, in conjunction with other factors, such as the length of the retained term and, and the value of the house. And we'll go through some mathematical calculations here to show you how this is calculated. And because this 75-20 rate is currently 1.4% per year right now, it, it makes it uh, it makes Cupert's a very attractive planning idea to pass wealth in, in houses that clients have. And the general premise behind using a Cupert is that any growth in the house above and beyond the Section 75-20 rate is going to pass to the grantor's beneficiaries free of additional gift or estate tax. So it's it's kind of using this, this uh, leverage here in, in, in trying to out-earn this very low hurdle. And if, if the house does that, and we all hope that, that houses will grow by more than that over the length of the next decade or so, then it's it's certainly going to be a, a, a positive plan and, and it will, it will accomplish our objective of passing wealth on to the next generation. Another interesting point that I want to point out is that if the grantor lives in the house after this retained term expires, then the grantor is required to pay rent to the trustee. And that could be a very difficult selling point for some clients who, who are reluctant to pay rent on a house that they previously owned. But as you can see, the payments of rent could get additional assets out of the estate of the grantor and this is a requirement that must be followed in order for this QPERT to really be effective. Okay, as promised on the next slide, I have some basic principles illustrated in mathematical by mathematical example. So let's assume that we have a 68-year-old grantor funding a QPERT with a home that is worth $1 million on funding. Let's also assume that the grantor says, I'll retain the right to live in the house for 10 years, and at the time of funding, the Section 75-20 rate is 1.4%. Now, based on this, the grantor is considered as making a taxable gift of $632,370 on funding. So the, the other portion of the value of the house is essentially retained by the grantor, and that's, that's the basic principle here. Now, if the, if the house appreciates the value by 5% annually, at the end of the 10-year retained term, the house, house is going to be worth approximately $1.62 million, uh, and, and because of this, you're going to save estate tax of approximately $570,000 if the estate tax rate is 35%. Now, of course, this assumes that the grant four has survived the retained term, uh, and we'll get into that later on as to you know, how, how that plays into, into effect. Um, now, if you look at the last point here on this slide, the probability of a 68-year-old individual under the IRS tables surviving until age 78 is 72.6689%. So the odds are in your favor in this case that the grantor is going to outlive this retained term. And certainly we want to be cognizant of the age of our, of our grantor client here just to make sure that the life expectancy requirement is something that we can, uh, we're more likely than not at least, to surpass. Okay, just some nomenclature here on the next slide for, for the discussion that we're going to have on Cuperts. One of the main terms kicked around here today is, is the term term holder. And the term holder simply means the individual that is that under the terms of the trust has the ability to live in the residence for the retained term. It's exactly what it sounds like, and it's, it's just shorthand to describe that individual. The next term is the retained term, which is the period during which the term holder has the sole and exclusive right to reside in the res residence free of paying rent. After expiration of this retained term, as I said, the term holder would have to pay rent if, if he were to... Uh, reside in the house at that point based upon fair market value. And moving on to the next slide, we have another, another, another definition, and I'm going to pass it over to Ken to tell us about the word personal residence in this context. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> a personal residence uh, is what gets contributed to a QPERT. And basically what it is is that it's a residence that's not occupied by anyone other than the term holder or the term holder's spouses and dependents. Uh, the main thing is that this property needs to be available for use by the term holder at all times. Um, generally, it is acceptable that another person has a, or not, sorry, that another person is actually residing in the property so long as they don't have a legal right to reside in the residence. So for instance, you can gift a beach house to a cuper and you can allow a friend to stay in the beach house. Uh, but so long as they are paying rent and they have no legal right to actually stay there, then you should still have a, a personal residence with respect to that beach house. So if you want to see some more additional examples um, where the IRS describes what qualifies as a personal residence and what doesn't, 
we provide you with the Treasury regulation site down there as well. And again, a lot of these things are very technical, um, so it's worthwhile checking them out in the, reg in the regs and the examples to make sure that you don't have an issue. A couple other things about the personal residence. Uh, the personal residence, as you see on this next slide, it can include some additional structures and adjacent land next to the residence. The key here is that it has to be uh, relatively normal with respect to the piece of property that gets contributed. So if you were talking about a home here in Pinellas, you know, maybe a half an acre would be okay. Um, but if you were trying to put a home with about two and a half to three acres in there, that might be seen as excessive with all that additional land. Now, if you're out in the middle of Iowa, that three acres would probably seem smaller. <coughs> so it's something to consider. Uh, it depends on where the property is located. And basically the rule of thumb is that it must not be in excess of what's reasonably appropriate uh, given the size of the residence and its location. Another thing to note is that the term personal residence does not include the household furnishings or any other personal property located in the residence. Um, so if you're talking about having a beach house and let's say you have some valuable artwork or you have some china or something along that line, that's not going to be included in the cupid. Uh, the cupid is the beach house itself. It's not the underlying assets that you're housing inside the cupid. So it's pretty logical, but it's something you want to make sure you're aware of and that your clients are aware of, um, that those items that are in the house, that, that's not being passed free of estate tax. All right, so Chris, would you like to talk about the federal tax consequences for us? Of course. Now, as I indicated earlier, upon funding, there's going to be a gift tax imposed based upon the present value of the remainder interest in, in the residence that's transferred to the trust. And this present value is calculated by using the 7520 rate as a discount rate uh, upon the return, retained length of the retained term and the value of the house, as we illustrated earlier. But of course, the grantor can use all or part of, of his or her $5,120,000 lifetime gifting exclusion to offset any gift tax that might be imposed in this case. Now, if the grantor survives the retained term, any assets remaining in the trust pass to the grantor's spouse, descendants, or other desired beneficiaries without any estate tax uh, or, or gift tax, additional gift tax being assessed on that on those assets. And that's 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 really what we're trying to shoot for here. Uh, that's that's one of the keys with with Cupid planning. Now, if the grantor dies during the retained term, the value of, of the trust assets are included in the grantor's gross estate for federal estate tax purposes. Uh, but of course. If the grantor did not engage in any of this planning, then those assets would have been included in his estate regardless. So it's something to think about. Uh, is really, you're not really going to lose anything other than administrative costs and maybe uh, you know opportunity costs. But outside of that, cupids really don't have a downside to them. Now, because cupid assets are included in the grantor's estate uh, if he died during the retained term, the cupid is subject to an estate tax inclusion period or it's commonly called the ETIP period. And this means that GST exemption cannot be allocated to the trust until the retained term expires. So cupids are not really the most popular planning device for GST planning. And then another thing to think about here is that you're going to have to allocate GST exemption according to the value of the house at the end of the retained term. Now, if, if home prices increase as we all hope they will, then that means you're really not going to get the biggest bang for your buck uh, with respect to GST exemption allocation. And finally, the federal income tax uh, considerations with respect to cupids. You know, the grantor is, is a beneficiary of the cupid during the retained term. And because of that, the trust is what's called a disregarded grantor trust for federal income tax purposes, which essentially means that the trust does not exist for income tax purposes. And all income, deduction, and credit will be placed on the grantor's tax return as if the grantor entered into, or as if the grantor earned any of the income or had the deductions himself. And of course, we can put other provisions in the trust to, uh, to cause it to be a grantor trust. And oftentimes, we do that intentionally. But you know, there's really no way to get around having it be a grantor trust during the retained term. OK, on the next slide, just a little more background on Cupert's. So as I indicated earlier, they're created by statute under Internal Revenue Code Section 2702 and the regulations they're under. Uh, they have myriad rules regarding this that we have to follow and, and, and really be cognizant of so as to, to have cupids be effective and not run afoul of the IRS uh, restrictions placed on this. Now, it's, we'll give you citations throughout this presentation, uh, and I believe it's, it's uh, 
Regulation Section 2702-5 is the key one here with respect to Cupert's. And I'm sure Ken will be digging deep there with, with respect to some of those details here in a minute. OK, we get into the Cupert requirements that are imposed by these regulations and statute. And now Ken's going to walk us through these seven requirements that the trust must meet in order to qualify as a Cupert. Ken? Thanks, Chris. And as Chris mentioned, because Cuperts are created by statute, you need to be very specific and make sure that you qualify with respect to all of the items that are required. Um, they're all listed in the statute. They're listed in the regulations. It's not very difficult to follow them, but it's something that you need to make sure your form is correct. Because if the form doesn't satisfy any of these requirements, then you no longer have a Cupert, which means you probably made a much larger taxable gift than you intended, or you're not going to be able to get the asset out of the estate at all because of the retained interest that the grantor has. One thing to note is that with respect to all the requirements that we're going to talk about for the next few minutes, these provisions must continue for the entire time that the term holder has the right to reside in the residence. Once the, ex or once the retained term is expired, then the trust can, can provide for other things to happen. It doesn't have to have these requirements continue indefinitely for the length of the trust. It's just they need to re actually be there for the length that the trust is, in is intended to qualify for a Cupert. So turning to the seven requirements. Item number one, the trust must require that any income that's generated by the trust has to be distributed to the term holder. Um, typically, the Cupert, it's, it's really not going to earn any income. Uh, the main asset is going to be the residence that you're transferring. Um, obviously, that can't be rented to a third party, because otherwise you would have already run afoul of the fact that the term holder has to have the unfettered right to live there. So the only chance that you'd have here is, is basically if something happened to the residence, uh, it was converted into cash, and then you continued using the trust to have it as a qualified annuity trust, which we're going to discuss in the subsequent slides. So if that does occur, it's just important to note that the trust document must require that any of the income be generated actually be distributed to the term holder. A couple of other things is that the trust must prohibit during that the uh, distribution of corpus to anyone other than the grantor. But again, this is only during the retained term. So it's while the grantor has the right to live in the house, no one else can get any assets out of the house, or out of the trust, rather. Um, but once that retained term is done, then it can be distributed to the remainder beneficiaries as the trustee sees fit. OK, turning to the next slide, subject three. This is a little bit more complicated. Um, one of the requirements is that the trust document has to require that during the retained term, the only asset of the trust must be one personal residence of the term holder. Um, this is subject to a couple of exceptions, which we're going to get into. But it's important to note, and we're going to talk about it in more depth later, the grantor can have two different Cuperts. That's permissible um, and with a couple of restrictions, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But one thing to note is that if the grantor wants to contribute two properties, he has to create two Cuperts. So it is permissible to have Cuperts with respect to two properties. But they have to be in separate Cuperts. You cannot combine them into one Cupert if you do you don't have a Cupert. So it's something that is a little bit of a hidden item. Uh, it's definitely a trap for the unwary, but it's something you want to make sure you're aware of so that you don't run afoul of that problem. A couple of things that the Cupert can contain in addition to the personal residence. Uh, one is that it is allowed to maintain some cash. Basically, you can think of this as like an operating account or a maintenance account. Um, it's, you have to look at the fact that the trust can have six months' worth of cash from the date it's contributed to pay for expenses such as like a monthly mortgage or taxes or insurance or other maintenance expenses that are expected to be there. Um, if, the, if you're going to have the trust allowing this, then the trust needs to provide that the trustee will determine the amount, that, that, that six-month amount, what that dollar amount is, that trustee needs to determine this quarterly and make sure that there is not an excess amount of cash in the trust. So every quarter, the trustee is going to say, OK, for the next six months, essentially my operating budget for running this house is x dollars. And if I have x plus one dollar, then the trustee has to distribute that one dollar, or whatever that excess is, they have to distribute it quarterly to the term holder. Right? In addition to that, the trust also has to require that if the term holder's interest terminates, at the expiration of the term, or expiration of the return, retained term, rather, that the trustee has 30 days after that to pay whatever excess cash is in the trust back to the term holder. Uh, in addition, the trust can also permit for the sale of the residence, 
Um, it's subject to some restrictions, which we're going to talk about on slide 18. And if the residence is actually sold, then the trust can hold the, pre the proceeds from the sale in a separate account. All right, a couple other things with respect to what assets the trust can hold in addition to the residence. Um, one, the trust may permit improvements to the residence. So the trust can be permitted to hold, also be permitted to hold one or more insurance policies on the residence. Now, in the event that the residence is damaged or destroyed and the funds are not used to repair the residence, um, then they're going to have to put those funds into a separate account, similar to how we just, just discussed under item A related to the sale of the property. A couple of other things which were a surprise, at least to me, when we were putting this, this together is that when you contribute the, I always thought you had to contribute property to a cuper. It appears actually that what you can do is that if the grantor is under contract to purchase a residence, that the grantor can essentially contribute that right to purchase the residence to the trust along with the necessary cash uh, to purchase the residence. Um, so basically, if you know that you're going to close in a couple of months and for whatever reason you want to make that taxable gift, you know, let's say you want to make that taxable gift before the end of the year, uh, you should be able to actually sign a contract, which so long as it's effective before the end of March, and and con contribute that within that three-month window, you know, late in December to the Cupert, and you would be okay. Now, Ken, quick question on that. What is the date of funding there? Is it when the cash is contributed or when the property is purchased? No, it would be the, when the date of funding would be when the cash is contributed to the trust. Uh, so you'd be able to actually fund the trust in December, utilize that increased gift tax exclusion before you have any concern about it going back to $1 million or something along that line. Um, and even though the closing doesn't occur until, you know, hopefully it would occur sometime in February so that you're not running up against that three-month window, but the closing could occur in February and you still would have a Kubrick if that was effective. But you have to have the contract signed when the cash goes in. Right. The, it, you have to be under, the grantor has to be under contract when the cash goes in. And a similar line is that the trust actually has the ability to purchase another residence. And so if additional cash needs to go in to have that happen, um, the trust itself actually has to be under contract. And, and again, it's a three-month window from the date the cash is contributed to the date when the trust would actually have to close on the property. All right, a couple of other requirements, and some of these seem to be awfully similar to what we see with the graphs. Uh, the trust must prevent prepayment of the term holder's interest meaning that you can't buy out the term holder's interest. Another item is that the trust must provide that the trust ceases to be a for if some of the specified events occurred. And we're going to talk about these on 20 or 21. And basically what it gets to is the fact that it's, you know, legis the legislation uh, that allows us to do this, it's, it's a gift from, from the IRS and Congress essentially, and if certain things occur, you're no longer going to have that benefit that you would expect to occur under a Cupert. So again, we'll talk about those in a couple of slides. All right, another requirement is that if the trust fails to qualify as a Cupert, that within 30 days of ceasing to qualify as a Cupert, the terms of the trust have to provide for certain procedures with respect to the assets of the trust. Uh, you have a couple of options here. Either the terms of the trust can provide that if, the trust, if it no longer qualifies as a cupert, that all of the assets are going to be distributed outright and free of the trust to the term holder. Second option, which is probably the better option, um, is that the trust can provide that the assets would be held in a separate share of the trust uh, that would meet the requirements for a qualified annuity interest for the duration of the term holder's retained term. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more on slide 28. Um, but essentially, it kind of switches the cupert into a grat. Um, that's kind of the best way to conceptualize it. It's not necessarily a full grat with respect to all the terms and conditions that apply to it, um, but it's very similar and it helps to make sure that those assets don't come back into the estate. Now, if you want to provide your trustee with discretion, that's also acceptable. The trust can provide that the trustee has the discretion to choose either option A or option B above. So that might be the best thing if you want to actually trust the trustee to do the right thing. If you want to kind of bind the trustee, then you might want to consider having option B in your trust document that hopefully the planning technique would still work. Another thing, and this is really an interesting point as well, is number seven, the trust must prohibit the trust from selling or transferring the residence to the grantor, the grantor spouse, or an entity controlled by either of them. And then here's the kicker, is that even after the retained term expires, 
if the Cupert is still a grantor trust, that trust cannot sell the house to the grantor, the grantor spouse, or another grantor's grantor trust, or to any entity controlled by either of them. And the concern here by the IRS and Congress when they enacted this was that you could essentially shift the wealth of the house uh, by paying minimal gift tax down to the remainder of beneficiaries after the end of the retained term. And then if you had a grant or trust, what I could do then is I could take cash uh, or another asset with you know a basis very similar or equal to the value, and I could substitute that asset into the trust, which had the house, get my house back, and then when I die, I can still qualify for the $250,000 increase with respect to my basis and not having to recognize gain on the, on the house, or I could sell the house, um, I'm sorry, I could die and get full basis step up on the house, or I could sell the house before I die and not have to recognize that first $250,000 worth of gain uh, with respect to the sale. And so that was the loophole that they wanted to close. Um, that is one downside of using the Cupert as a technique. Um, is that you're going to get a carryover basis, and specifically with respect to your, you know, to the residences when you sell them, you're no longer going to have that exclusion with respect to the, the certain portion of the gain. Um, so it is something that is a downside, of course, with many of our clients, especially if they purchase real estate, you know, relatively recently. If you think about people that bought a beach house in 2007 or somewhere around there, uh, chances are that property they have basis that's significantly in excess of what it's worth. So transferring it for into a Cupert might not be a bad idea now um, because it's going to take a while for that property to, to generate enough growth to actually have some gain that they would have to recognize. But it is something you want to make sure your clients are aware of, um, especially with respect to a principal residence. All right, so one more thing I'm going to talk about, and then I'm going to kick it back to Chris, um, is that we just spent a lot of time talking about how you have to satisfy all these requirements. Um, best nature is to satisfy the requirements, but you don't necessarily have to immediately. And so what they've done is they've given you a little bit of a grace period here. And if you formed a QPERT this year, uh, the next April your gift tax return would be due. And let's say sometime between then and next April you figure out that somehow you screwed up the terms of the QPERT. Or more realistically, let's say that you have a new client who comes in with a QPERT and unfortunately, the attorney that had drafted that Cupert, that Cupert did it incorrectly before because, of course, nobody listening would draft the Cupert the wrong way, especially after this great webinar that they're hearing. Uh, so anyway, so basically what you have is you have the ability to obtain a court order to modify the trust, or in certain states, if you don't need a court order and you can modify the trust through nonjudicial reformation, that's also okay. I would probably recommend getting a court order modify the trust so that it complies with the necessary requirements. If you get this done before the gift tax return is filed, that's great. Uh, if for some reason, you know, let's say that client comes to you and you don't have enough time to really dive into this before the gift tax return has to be filed, you still have a 90-day window after the gift tax return is filed, and that does include extensions as well. Uh, so you really could push that back to October if you needed to, plus another 90 days if you're looking at January of the following year. Now, if you're going to take care advantage of this window, one thing you have to know is that when you file the gift tax return, you need to attach a statement uh, signed by the grantor or the, you know, the person filing the gift tax return that they're going to get the reformation started within 90 days after the due date of the return. Another couple of items to note is that the reformation has to be completed within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, presumably, if there's any delay on the court's end, that's fine. It's just you can't delay it on your end to get the thing re re reformed. Um, and one last little bit of information, which is always nice to know, is that the IRS does have actually the permission or the authority to grant you relief under 9100 release to grant an additional extension of time. So if you do miss any of these deadlines, it's maybe not the end of the world. Um, obviously, you want to try not to be in this situation. But in the event that you are, you do have some alternatives and some options to hopefully get the trust to comply with the keeper terms. Thanks, Ken. Now, other considerations to think of here, if, if the residence in the Cupert is no longer held or used as a personal residence of the term holder, then the trust is not going to be considered as a keeper. So for example, if we'll say the, the client, the grantor, has a beach house that he uses as a second residence, and during the retained term, he says, you know what, I, I never used this thing, 
you know, so let me start renting it out. Well, if he starts renting it out, it's no longer a personal residence. So the trust, therefore, would not, no longer qualify as a Cupert, and, you know, you might have issues there with respect to uh, the, the actual funding of the actual uh, tax implications of the trust that could be catastrophic. So that's something to really consider. Another issue is that if the, if the house is sold, the residence in the trust is sold, and if there are no provisions in the trust which uh, allow the trust to convert to a grant, as indicated in slide 28, then uh, the, the trust asset, or the, the proceeds from the sale under the trust must be distributed uh, from the trust either within two years of the date of the sale, uh, determination of the term holder's interest, or the date on which a new residence is acquired by the trust if the proceeds are used to acquire a new residence. And it's the earliest of those three dates that, uh, that will cause the, the trust to no longer be a cupert. Now on the next slide, we, we have the issue of when the resident suffers damage or destruction or, or some type of casualty which res renders it to be unusable. In that event, that the trust has to provide that the trust will no longer be a cuper uh, on a date that's two years after the date of damage, <clears throat> unless before that date a replacement residence is acquired by the trust or replacement or repair of, of the damaged residence is completed. So that those are issues certainly to, to look out for. Uh, number four on this slide here also talks about situations where insurance proceeds are paid uh, with respect to damage or destruction. And the trust has to provide that the trust will no longer be a keeper with respect to the insurance proceeds received upon the earliest of a date that's two years after the date of damage or destruction, the termination of the term holder's interest in the trust, so the termination of that retained term, or the date on which a substitute replacement residence is, is acquired by the trust. So again, these are issues to, to really keep, keep present uh, when we're drafting these documents here. Let's move on to the next slide here. All right, and I'll jump in on this one, Chris. Um, basically, with respect to the Cuperts, what we talked about briefly earlier is that you can form two Cuperts. One thing I didn't mention then is that if you are going to form two Cuperts, one of the pieces of property has to be your principal res or your primary residence or principal residence. So you can't have your normal home and two vacation homes and make cuperts with respect to each of the vacation homes. Uh, it's just not going to work. And if you ever have a question with respect to what your primary residence is, this might not be the best year to make two cuperts. Um, if you have that question at all, and we had it with a client where they uh, had recently moved and I wasn't aware that they had moved, and when you looked at the property appraiser website, it still listed their old address as their homestead, and they still own the old address. They just weren't using it as their primary residence anymore. Uh, so it was cause for concern for a minute, but it turned out to be not an issue because they actually had had the homestead application changed. It just hadn't been updated yet on the property appraiser website. So in a situation where the family has the two beach houses, um, what they're going to want to do if they want to do Cupert's, assuming they own those beach houses jointly, is the husband and wife should transfer one beach house to husband and transfer the other beach house to wife, and then they can go ahead and utilize uh, Cupert's to get rid of both of those beach houses. So it's something to consider as a planning mechanism. A couple of other things that we want to talk about. Uh, one of the items that Chris touched on earlier is the continued use of the residence by the grantor after the expiration of the retained term. Basically, you're going to have a 2036 issue here, possibly. Um, so one of the things to think about is that um, if the terms of the trust, the residence is transferred to a descendant of the grantor, uh, which is typical, and the grantor keeps living in the trust, even if there's no written agreement, they're going to find, the IRS is going to find that there's an implied understanding that the grantor had the right to live in the property, and therefore the entire value of that property is going to come back into the grantor's estate. Obviously, that's going to have significant estate tax implications, and you're not going to get any benefit of the grad even though you, su you survive the retained term. So one thing that you might want to consider is building into your trust document that after the retained term ends, if the grantor is still residing in the house, that he or she automatically enters into a lease with the trustee of the, of the cuper. Um, you know, whether it's going to be upheld or not, it's not necessarily Sure, uh, but it, it gives you something to argue in front of the IRS if it ever comes up on audit. Um, so another thing to make sure you're certain about is that you want to make sure that the residence is being leased to the grantor for the fair market value. 
Uh, it might be really hard to determine with some items. Uh, some neighborhoods, it's hard to set what the lease value would be because nobody leases their house or rents their house out in those neighborhoods. Uh, so to the extent that you have any question, you're probably going to want to get an appraisal done. Uh, granted, it's an additional expense, but compared to the estate tax that you could possibly pay if this gets pulled back in, at least it gives you a basis for why you're charging X dollars a month to the grantor for the right to live in that house. And again, they might have to look outside of the area. They might have to look to neighborhoods you know, further away than what you would expect to just to establish what the market would be. Now again, kind of on the idea that all hope isn't lost again, we wanted to provide you with the citation for uh, the estate of Sylvia Reese, the tax court memorandum decision 2011. And basically what occurred here is that the keeper had ended and everybody kind of said, yep, we should get around to signing a lease. Uh, the attorney had recommended signing a lease. And unfortunately, you know, six, seven months down the road, uh, Miss Reese died. And guess what? They hadn't gotten around to ever signing that lease yet. Um, but the court here found that there was enough evidence to indicate that they had intended to sign the lease. And therefore, they didn't bring the property back in, notwithstanding the fact that the grantor was living on the property without paying for it after her death. So again, it's not a situation you want to be in. But just be aware that this case law, or this case is out there. If you ever are in the situation, you might be able to find that your facts match those. Okay, as Chris touched on earlier, the Cuper probably is not the best vehicle with respect to uh, generation skipping transfer planning. Um, as Chris mentioned, one of the things is that you're not going to get any leverage because of the ETIP period. Um, so you're going to have to allocate the full market value of the house at the end of the term. It's not based on what the value of the house is at the beginning of the term or the discounted value of the gift that you contributed or the gift that you made when you formed the Cuper. Um, one other thing to note, which we didn't discuss earlier, is that the predeceased ancestor exception, and for those that aren't familiar with that, what that is is that with respect to generation skipping transfers, typically uh, you're fine making the transfer to your child. Uh, if you make a transfer to your grandchild, typically that's going to be subject to GST tax. But if your child is, has predeceased at that point so that there isn't a living relative in a generational level, you know, when you're looking at that family tree between you and your grandchildren, your grandchildren move up a level and are considered to be your children with respect to the generation skipping tax. And so therefore there's no generation skipping tax actually payable on a distribution to them. It's a logical rule. It makes sense. Here's where the disconnect is, is that with the ETIP period, you look at the ETIP period, and we're going to allocate our GST at the end of the ETIP period. Now, if you decide you don't want to do that, that's fine. The problem is, is that the snapshot of when that predeceased ancestor rule occurs, that happens on funding of the QPER. So let's say you have a 10-year term. If, you know, year one, all of your kids are alive. Everything's fine. Then year two, if one of your kids passes away, your grandchild doesn't step up anymore. They're no longer considered to be standing in the shoes of your child with respect to that, that step up rule. And so the problem is, is that at the end of year 10, if distributions are being made and you put in that trust that it should be divided and held per SERPES, you're going to need to allocate generation skipping tax exemption to that trust. Otherwise, you're going to have a taxable distribution or a taxable termination because all of a sudden that separate share, which is going to be held for the benefit of the deceased child, is now held for the benefit of the grandkids. And again, they're not going to step up a generation. So that's all going to be subject to generation skipping tax. So one thing you might want to consider is with a QPER, instead of putting in per sterpes language, uh, you should have devices to kids that lapse and then have a makeup under your living trust or under an, an irrevocable trust or a gifting trust, whereby if one child or you know the, the line of one child is getting more assets under a QPER, that the grandchildren of that predeceased child would get an equal amount of assets first out of a gifting trust or another trust before all the other assets are divided equally amongst the family. That's one way of avoiding the problem. OK, another quick thing is applicable discount. Now, when you have a husband and wife, uh, you know typically we're going to own the house jointly. And if they want to do a QPER, rather than transferring it to husband and having husband transfer 100% of the property to the QPER, you might want to consider having husband and wife transfer the property 50% to husband and 50% to wife. And then they each can contribute this 50% interest to a separate QPER. 
the benefit of this, besides the fact that you're hedging your bets, that you know both of them aren't going to die before the end of the retained term, and hopefully you're going to get at least half of these assets out of the estate without being subject to estate tax. The other benefit is that you can take a fractional interest. Um, nobody's going to want to buy a 50% interest in a house for half of what the house is worth. You know, frequently when we've been doing these cuperts and filing our gift tax returns, uh, you know, because you have to file a gift tax return, you have to get a qualified appraisal. And when you're getting that qualified appraisal to determine the value of the house, you also want to make sure that that qualified appraisal takes into that fractional interest discount. Um, typically for us, we've been seeing these in the range of 15%. Now, if you have a house that's very, very valuable and you're concerned about audit and you want to just really get this locked up really well with respect to how the tax court or how another court might apply the concept of that fractional discount, and we provided you with a site here. It's uh, Andrew K. Ludwig, Tax Court Memorandum Decision 2010. And basically, in this case, what the tax court did uh, is they went down and they said, okay, you know what, if we had two owners, we would have a 10% chance of partition, and therefore we're going to take uh, nine, we're going to determine what the value would be of the whole property, and we're going to weight that as 90% of the value, and we're going to determine what the value of the partition property would be, multiply that by two to get the value of the whole property, we're going to give that 10% of the weight. We're going to average that out. The court went even further to say that there would be court costs associated with the partition, so they took that into account. Uh, they went even further to say that the, if it was one house, it would probably take a year to sell. They took into account what costs it would be to maintain the house. And then they also went further to say if it was partitioned, it would take two years to sell, took into account what cost that would be as well. And that's how they came up with their fractional discount. So to me, that seems a little excessive. Um, but again, if you have a large house and you're worried about the valuation discount that's coming in, that's going to be a really good model to follow. Well, can I have a quick question on, on the fractional discount situation? If spouses own a house jointly uh, and you want to convey that 50% to each of them individually so as to take advantage of this planning strategy, should you wait any period of time before conveying it 50% to each and then having them subsequently convey it to a keeper? Um, it probably wouldn't be the worst idea. Um, I, at the same time, I don't really know of any case law or any commentary out there that talks about the step transaction applying here to compress uh, you know, the, the two steps into one to get rid of that discount. Uh, but in the same breath, if you want to be extra safe and you have the time to, it probably wouldn't hurt to make the one deed and then wait a little bit to, to make the other deed. But there's no bright line test for that. And again, I'm not aware of anything out there that specifically is on point denying that discount because of that. Well, that's, that's certainly true. Uh, in other areas of law, it's something that's kind of a hot topic. But it's interesting to note that we haven't seen it in this area. Uh, on the next slide here, we have more mathematical examples. Uh, this one ex illustrating this 50% interest to a keeper as opposed to just the entire house to a keeper. So let's just say that we have a 68-year-old grantor, and he transfers a half interest in this house. And the, the entire house is value, valued at $860,000 on funding. Now, using a 15% valuation discount based on the criteria that Ken just discussed, the valuation of this, the value of this half undivided interest in the, in the house is worth $355,500 on funding. So if the retained term is 10 years, and the grantor is considered as making a taxable gift of approximately $203,000 upon funding. And this comprises about 55.5% of the value of the transfer. Now, if the, the grantor's spouse establishes a keeper with respect to the other one-half undivided interest in the home, you, know, you really get the opportunity to kind of to, to hedge your bets, as Ken put it, and really take advantage of this discount mechanism. Uh, if, if both the grantor and the grantor's spouse survive for 10 years, then you're going to have about $450,000 combined estate tax savings, again, based upon a 35% estate tax rate. And when proposing these, these cupids to clients and the numbers behind them, you, know, you really have to look at the criteria uh, and, and that kind of, or, or the components that com comprise the gift element and really try to figure out what the best retained term length is. Now, to my knowledge, there's really no minimum or maximum with the retained term. I think actually a minimum would have to be two years. Uh, there isn't really a maximum. But of course, the longer the retained term, the lower the probability that the grantor would survive the retained term. So for our 68-year-old client, we ran this chart, which illustrates the various retained terms and the actual value of the gift 
upon the transfer of the house to, to the trust. And on the left-hand column, we start with six years, and we go down in increments of two years all the way up to 16 years, just to show you how the value of the gift here in the, in the second column decreases as the retained term gets longer. And the reason for that is the probability of death before a certain age. Now, a 68-year-old will survive to be 70 almost 96% of the time, while a 68-year-old 60, will survive to be 88, you know, only 32% only of the time. So it's, it's important to consider the age of the client when, when picking a retained term, and also, you know, the amount of, of the gift that you want to make here. And this chart also illustrates uh, the amount of state tax savings if the grantor survives the term. So here on the, the fifth column, as you go down, you'll see the savings gets better as, as the retained term goes up. So this, essentially the stakes are higher with the retained term, but you know, the, the risk is a lot higher as well because the grantor could die during the retained term and then you would have state tax inclusion of the value of the house and the other assets in the trust. So this is a neat little chart here, and, and if any of you are, would like us to send this to you in an Excel spreadsheet, we'd be happy to do so so you can see the mechanics behind this chart here. Okay, as we, we've alluded to earlier, that the, the discussion regarding converting the Cupid to a qualified annuity interest. Now, this essentially means that the Cupid is going to be converted to a GRAT you know, at, at, at some point during the retained term. Now, the trust has to contain the appropriate language. Now, if the trust has the language, then the trust has to provide that the right of the term holder to receive an annuity depends on, you know, whatever whatever's the, the, the applicable cessation date. So whether it's the date of the sale of a residence, the date that the residence is damaged or destroyed, or the date that the residence is no longer a personal residence uh, for, for whatever reason. So, you know, that's, that's really when the, the annuity conversion would begin. Now, the trust also has to provide that the annuity amount can be, can be uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the trust may provide that the annuity amount may be deferred for 30 days after the conversion. And that's the kind of, you know, just to get your, all your ducks in a row and make sure all the, the appropriate uh, documentation is taken care of. And that's kind of a little show of benevolence by the IRS, but, you know, it's something we'll gladly take. And, of course, if the payment is deferred, the payment's got to bear interest at a rate that's no less than the 7520 rate, in effect, uh, when the trust ceases to be a cuper. So that rate is currently 1.4%, so unless interest rates really rocket up, this shouldn't be too much of a big deal. All right, now, Ken, how do we value this annuity interest? Um, basically, I'm going to take a pass on this, and I'm just going to tell you that the rules are very technical. Uh, it depends on whether the annuity has to include the value of the residence or whether it does not include a residence. And what we've done is we provide you with the Treasury regulation here citation for both. So if you're in either of these situations and you need to determine it, um, you're going to want to refer back to these regulations to make sure that you're getting it done correctly. All right, the next slide, just in the interest of time, we're just going to skip over, but we thought it would be helpful to have right at the end. It's just kind of a recap of what we felt were some of the more important items. And then a couple other slides to talk about. Uh, one is that because this is a statutory creation, um, it's similar to a CLAT in the, the idea that the IRS has actually provided sample agreements. Uh, so if you look at Revenue Procedure 2003-42, that's going to provide you with a sample QPER um, for a one-term holder. And similar to other, or other times that the IRS has provided sample agreements, the agreement also provides for alternative language, which you can incorporate into the trust depending on your facts and circumstances. Uh, so as I said, the sample QPER deals with one grantor. Uh, and in this situation, the retained term is equal to the lesser of the life of the grantor of a set number of years. Um, in Section 4 of the Revenue Procedure, that's where the substantive provisions of the trust are listed. Uh, if your cuper has different provisions than the substantive provisions, there's no guarantee it's going to qualify. It doesn't mean it's not going to qualify. It just means that you're not going to be under that safe harbor. So if you're concerned about it, you want to make sure that you match up with Section 4 and you're not omitting anything from Section 4, and that if you have anything added to the trust that's not in Section 4, that you're really sure that's not going to blow your cuper. Um, one last note is that with respect to private letter, letter rulings, uh, if your form is in compliance with the RevProc 2003-42, they're not going to give you a private letter ruling. The only way that you're going to get a private letter ruling is if you do have these substantive provisions that are in addition to or omitted from Sections 4 and 6, in this case, with the RevProc. 
So if you do have a trust and it's a large amount of money that you're dealing with here um, and you're at all concerned, you can get a private letter ruling. Uh, but again, it's only available in situations where you might have an issue. If you're following the form, just for the sake of simplicity, the IRS is not going to grant you that private letter ruling. So with that, I'll turn it back to Chris to wrap it up, and I appreciate everybody joining us today. Thanks, Ken. And uh, you know, just, just to recap here, as we, we started off this discussion, Cuperts are, are really appropriate now uh, based on the depressed home values and the, low, the historically low 75-20 rate and interest rate environment, uh, especially when you have clients that really want to very, very uh, much giving and generous to their kids. You know, giving the house is something that a lot of people don't think of. Uh, but the way that Hubert rules are drafted, it's you know, it's it's kind of a no a no lose. If you don't, if you if you die during the retained term, if the grantor dies during the retained term, you're not going to be any worse off than if you had done no planning at all. So you know, with that in mind, it's it's really a key time for us as advisors to be recommending our clients, uh, or at least advising them that this option is there, and it's something that they you know would be best suited to take advantage of based upon the situation. And with that, Ken and I thank you both for uh, for enjoying us for joining us today, and we appreciate uh, your attention here. And, and if any questions at all, please don't hesitate to email us at our email addresses, which is on the first page of the presentation. And we wish you a pleasant afternoon.